This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. There's never been a better time to make good use of your kit. Inspire others, make some extra cash and make a difference. Sell your used kit today at mpb.com forward slash sell and let someone else love it as much as you have. In this episode of the Photography News podcast, Midnight Rambles, Cornish Ambles and a Boy Racing Shambles. Hello and welcome to this latest episode of the Photography News podcast. My name is Roger Payne. I'm the Editorial Director at Photography News. And I'm delighted to say that this is a podcast of firsts, two firsts in particular. The first first is that it's our first ever after hours podcast. Normally we record this during the day, but for various reasons, we're doing this at just after eight o'clock on a Thursday evening. Uh, so um, God knows what that's going to end up like. Bear in mind, we're all tired and hot and sweaty after the weather we've been having. And the second first is the fact that normally we're in our own houses, but this time I'm looking at my two colleagues who are sat side by side uh, in a beautiful <laughs> Victorian style living room. Uh, so without further ado, I thought I would introduce them both. And given this is his a late night podcast, I thought I'd introduce them and ask what their what drink they will be nursing through the podcast this evening. So starting with contributing editor, Mr. Kingsley Singleton. Hi, Kingsley. Hello. How are you? Um, I'm all right. It's lovely to see the pair of you together. Now, we're sat in, or you're sat in your house. I yeah, believe. yeah. All that, and it's not a holographic Will Chung. No, it's a <laughs> real life Will Chung. And there's an impressive selection of books behind you. I'm wondering which one you pull down to get gain access to the secret <laughs> corridor. And so, Faith, what, what tipple will you be nursing this evening? Uh, well, we've, we've actually both had an alcohol-free beer but I might switch to a regular beer if there's a sort of a like a like a the the, the archetypal Schweppes noise. Uh, <laughs> it up, that'll be me switching to an actual beer. Yeah. And talking of noises, if you do pick up a slightly creaky sounding chair during the recording, we apologise for that. That's the that's the most modern furniture that Kingsley owns. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, it does creak away. But alongside Kingsley, quite literally, is editor Mr. Will Chung. Hi, Will. Lovely to see you. Hi, Rog. Great to be here. Um, it is rather novel, I have to say, and um, I haven't seen Kingsley for obviously over 18 months. I'm driving it Thursday. I don't really drink during the week, so I'm saving myself. <laughs> All good. Thank you. It's, it's great to be um, in company for once. <laughs> it's a rock and roll podcast with alcohol-free beer. Uh, and I haven't got a drink at all. So, uh, yeah, a bit of an oversight. <laughs> oh, you're getting the side down, Rog. Come on. I am indeed. I am indeed. So we'll start this uh, podcast in the same way that we start all podcasts. And I'm just seeing Kingsley now cracking a beer oh, open. You might not have quite got that, but well done. Um, and that is just to, to chat about what we've, uh, what we've been out photographing recently. We have had a little bit of a gap between the last two podcasts, largely because I was away on holiday and we've struggled a little bit to get to the, uh, the three of us together. But uh, Will, why don't, why don't you start? It looks like you've been, a li- now that the, the lockdown is lifted, we've had our freedom day. Um, it looks like you're you're taking full advantage of that. What have you been up to? Well, well, Rog, as you say, um, life is kind of getting back to normal, and we had planned a trip up to Newcastle uh, for Annie, my partner's um, friends, had a birthday party planned at the Baltic in Newcastle. So we had a few days off. We went to Newcastle. We went up Northumberland. We went to uh, Craster. We had a night in Holy Island. And then we stopped our way back back through uh, via Hadrian's Wall and Agegarth in the Dales. So we had a few days off. So I have been photographing a lot. Actually, to be fair, we came back on Sunday absolutely exhausted, <laughs> which we'd taken so many pictures. So we needed another holiday to get over the holiday, effectively. <laughs> but, you know, birds, urban landscape, insects, starscapes, I had a go at everything. It was grand, actually, to be out doing, you know, what is normal. So, so describe to me a typical Will Chung and Annie uh, photo break. This, is, it, is it all like, right, set your alarm for 4 a.m., let's go out and get the sunrise, and then... Um, Rog, our, our household is not known, our separate household, so I'm not known for being early risers. Right. So we, we don't see a single dawn. I mean, the, the dawn is very unsociable this time of year. I mean, to be out for, you know, 4 o'clock walking towards Dunstable Castle or something, it's just not on for us. So we, we have a leisurely morning, a leisurely breakfast, and we don't start shooting until, to be honest, when the, the light is not that great for scenics. 
but we stay up late, so we're the other end rather than the rather than the early end. We're the we're the late end. And did you did you come back, or have you had a chance to go start going through the the files that you shot, or have you um, are you still are they still copying across such as the volume of uh, of files that you've kept? <laughs> well, the thing is, like all good photographers nowadays, we went on our trips with laptops as well. So, and we were guilty of downloading our pictures over breakfast. I mean, we kind of we agreed we'd do that. We didn't say, oh, you know, we won't be any social or anything. We said if we didn't do stuff like that. We did it over breakfast, so we did that. So we've had a look already. I've had a look at some of my pictures. For instance, I was very keen to see what I'd managed to achieve up at Sycamore Gap, um, which is on Hadrian's Wall, you know, the tree made famous by, well, it was famous before Kevin Costner, but certainly it was made more famous by Kevin Costner and Morgan Freeman meeting underneath it. Um, but um, we, I did some starscapes. I thought I'd try and get the Milky Way up there. Um, and it was, you know, a good attempt. I, I failed miserably getting a decent Milky Way, but it was just a good experience. I, it's something I've never done before. Um, and walking across the countryside at one o'clock in the morning on my own, it's quite spooky. But um, I, I really loved it. Like I said, the results aren't special, but hey, I'm going to try it again. But some of the other shots, I've got a lot of good bugs. Um, and that, that was fun. I did a lot of butterflies. I tried some birds in the day. I was, they were less good. And in Newcastle, when we were there, it was very, very flat and dull. Nevertheless, we enjoyed it. Um, got, I, I'm sure we get something out of it, Roger. You know, we always get something out of it. Now, Kingsley, while we've uh, not been recording the podcast, you were, you were very disappointed because it sounded as though um, you've been extremely busy uh, with your camera. But of course, what regular listeners will be aching to hear will be a grip tape update on your the state of the uh, the sticky stuff that you plastered over your uh, your Nikon and grip. So how is it? Is it holding together under probably intense heat and usage? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't factored in the heat, but it's actually holding, it's holding together perfectly well and still providing acres of purchase. <laughs> uh, that's a good way of describing it. It hasn't, it hasn't increased the, um, the, the, the contact area on the grip at all, but it's made it more sticky. So, um, yeah, no, that's still going on. I mean, like, you know, maybe what I should do is get on like Etsy or eBay and kind of offer my services up to uh, like minded photographers. Yes, but in terms of like photographically, you've had some trips, um, you've, you've uh, been to see various things. So what have you been what have you actually been capturing during this time? I've been flinging my flinging myself around the UK, um, much like Kevin Costner, as Will mentioned in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Yeah, so I, I've been to the peaks for, for a bit to get out doing some landscapes. Um, I've been to Norfolk doing sort of uh, some, some landscapes, but more some sort of like walk around kind of stuff with a, with a macro lens that I was testing. Um, and while I was in Norfolk, I also went to visit some puppies, um, dogs, small dogs, um, and, and took some pictures of them. So that was good. Um, myself, um, the, the last podcast we recorded, we, I was about to go away on holiday. And you may recall, gentlemen, that... I had, a di- I had a difficult decision to make in terms of what kit I was going to take, but ultimately I decided just to take my XC4 and 27mm, um, which is what I did take, and it was absolutely fine. And it went everywhere with me. Uh, <laughs> we did quite a lot of walking, so it was, uh, it was quite a, a good companion for walks. Um, basically, the, uh, it, it was just nice and light, chucked it over my shoulder, carried it everywhere, the weather wasn't particularly kind. I found myself ending up uh, photographing quite a lot just in black and white because it was overcast quite a lot. And I, because I was taking sort of scenic type pictures on walks alongside the coast, we did a lot of, did some walks alongside the uh, Cornish coastal path. It proved to be the right choice. Kingsley. Yeah, going back to the camera itself, do you find it grippy enough, Rog? Can I <laughs> you a, a you... used roll of grip tape? <laughs> As you may well know, I did actually get the camera with the optional metal hand grip on it, mm. which does allow me a relatively sound purchase on said camera. However, I'm sure that a little bit of grip tape might be the perfect addition. So maybe you should bring it bring it over. Go on, Will. I'm going to ask you a question there, Roger. I mean, do you find it odd just carrying one camera and one lens on holiday? Because as an example, Annie and I on our trip, we had two backpacks full each, and we still left stuff in the car. So, I mean, we had my VW is full of camera kit, basically, and you got with one camera and lens. How, how do you feel about that? Are you, do you feel naked? 
Well, I did. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. Um, and I think it's it's about managing expectations with it. I often travel pretty light when it comes to camera gear. Um, I had previously done a holiday where I just used an X100S and nothing else. Um, I did a photo 24 where I just shot with a, a, a Nikon compact with a fixed lens. Um, so I, I think it, you know, it, it's a, like I say, managing expectations. Obviously, you're not going to be able to photograph um seabirds because there was some there were a few occasions when we were walking around a harbor for example and there was a there was like a cormorant stuck out in the middle of the harbor on a boat and you think oh that'd be a lovely picture but not with a 27 mil lens on it um but then you sort of just go well you know you look at it and think well that's a nice you know that's a lovely scene there's a lovely harbor with a with a boat and a cormorant on it um, and then you move on. And then when you find something that you want to photograph, then you you kind of make the most of it. No, I, I'm kind of quite happy with my limitations, um, obviously, as a photographer, as well as a, with the equipment I was carrying. <laughs> so as we've alluded to, it is the summer. It is really warm. I don't know what temperature it is right now, but it feels like it's in the 30s in my house because I live in a black barn. Um, and what that uh, traditionally means is that people take some time off work. Uh, either you might have kids uh, and so you're, you're sort of forced into it because of school holidays or it's just a nice time of the year to, to get some time off. So we thought we'd, we'd run through a few ideas that if you've got a day or half a day off coming up that you want to go out and try and get some, uh, get some pictures, we, uh, we thought we'd discuss some options for you to pursue. So Kingsley, I'm going to come to you first, given that you've, uh, you've recently been out and about Oh, you both have, but you've you've recently been out and about in the landscape, Kingsley. So if you had half a day or a day, what would you do and where would you go? Well, I suppose I should start by framing that maybe by, with what I wouldn't do. Um, I do well, in, in, so far, <laughs> insofar as like everyone thinks that summer's a terrible time to shoot landscapes. And like most of the time, that's right, because, you know, um, the the light isn't great. Pretty much, and and the, the hours when it is good are kind of pretty inaccessible. You know, you might be looking at half past four in the morning and nine o'clock at night or something like that. And as, as Will was saying earlier, when he went to shoot the Milky Way at Sycamore Gap, um, or was it Holy Island? You went to shoot the Milky Way. No, Sycamore Gap. Right. And, yeah. But anyway, the point is, you get that far north, the sky never gets dark. Things are difficult in the summer for landscape photographers, and, and and they're difficult beyond light as well. I was up in the peaks. I was at um, uh, insert edge name here because I've forgotten which one it was. Might have had Havisage. Stanage. Stanage Edge. Maybe it was Stanage Edge. Anyway, um, it's one where there's a car park right near it. Um, and it's uh, what it turned out was it was a nice evening um, and it was getting to sunset. And I got up there, got my kit out, noticed basically the car park was full of boy racers um, all having a great time going up down the hill, wheel spinning, drinking <laughs> beer. Um, and it was only when I got right out onto the edge that that, that kind of that it that I, you know that you sort of got the feeling that actually you, you're alone again. Um, I managed to kind of emerge from that unscathed, even though there was, I was carrying my tripod back in sort of attack position. <laughs> but actually, they were mostly just nice lads having a, having a nice time. Um, I mean, and, and so beyond that, it's something I did discover, and this wouldn't be what I necessarily would would leap to do um in in the summer but like i think you still can take um kind of good landscape pictures even in the middle of the day you just have to be in the right kind of weather so like if you have broken cloud and you can pick out features in the landscape that are being lit you have to wait you have to be mindful and you have to kind of watch for those things happening but um i'll, I'll put up I, I took some pictures um in in the peaks kind of like that so i'll, I'll put some of those up on the Instagram as well, kind of showing what I mean. Talk me through the process of um, going to photograph up at the insert name here, Edge. Is it an area that you know, and so therefore you don't need to recce? Or did you go up there and have a little look around the night before? Or what was the, how, how did you do that part of it? No, I, I knew I knew roughly sort of where it was, and I knew roughly what way it was facing, but I hadn't been there before. Or, or if I had been there before, there was so much cloud, I couldn't see off the edge anyway. But um, I, what I basically did was 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 what a lot of people do, which is I sort of I got there, I got there a, a fair bit before sunset, and then and then I gave myself some time to try and work out what I thought was a good composition, and then I waited for the sun to sink into the right kind of spot, um, and then you go through a sort of a 
a kind of a buzzy period of, of really enjoying it for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then the, the sun, was, it wasn't much of a sunset. It was a little sort of a glowing red ball and some dark clouds. Um, and then actually some, some really annoying clouds came along after the, the sky kind of cleared. And then these really sort of like weird shaped clouds came along, which I hated. So I had to <laughs> work out what to do with them. I just pointed the camera the other way and shot down the valley. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of, I mean, that's, that's I, I would do some research generally. I'd, I'd try to work out kind of what I was kind of facing when I got there. Um, but I had, no, I hadn't been there before. And the, and the photography window, how, how, how wide is it? I mean, so you, you, you got there in plenty of time. Sunset was, I don't know, what would it have been? 9.30ish, 9.15, 9.30ish? Well, what, what, what was lucky was um, the sun didn't actually come out until sunset. It came out sort of in the, in the gap between the fairly heavy cloud and the, and the horizon um, and sort of hung around for about five minutes. Well, it wasn't even that. It was probably like two and a half minutes and then left. So I was just kind of like trying to get through about three or four pictures um, you know, while remembering, like sort of vertical and horizontal, while remembering to rotate the filters back the right way. So like, you know, going from a, a vertical composition, if you then go horizontal and you, you know, switch your grad filters around, you've got to be dark yeah. on some of the picture, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of like, it, it, it was a rush. It's, it's not how you want it to be, um, but basically because the cloud was, was, was kind of heavy and the, the opportunity was pretty, um, was pretty swift. And then you span the camera around and you photographed after the sun had gone down, you photographed down the valley. Yeah, down the valley, which had got a little bit misty. Um, right. So that, that wasn't too bad. And I was sort of picking out, I think there was a, there was a town in the distance. I can't remember which town. But I didn't know where I was, Rog, basically. Presumably the, the mist was caused by aforementioned boy racers. It could have been. It could have been, <laughs> you know, like from a GTI just hanging across the, um, the thing. But what I, what I was going to say about what I would go and do this time of year more likely is I'd go and find a wood and go and shoot shoot sort of I like shooting woodland scenics and that's a great place in the summer to shoot because uh, you know you don't you, you still wouldn't necessarily want to be in there like right in the middle of the day but um you know you, you you can do that light and shade thing you can kind of and I, I would probably use like a you know this would be no surprise but a longer lens to pick out kind of tree shapes in the distance and stuff like that or maybe like if you were lucky enough to find some kind of patches of um flowers in the woodland kind of lit up, you know, and, and you know, it keeps you out of the sun as well, which is yeah. lucky for me because I'm really pacey. And, and I mean, I suppose that the challenging question here is, 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 is there, is there such a thing as bad light or is it just that as a, you know, it, or is it just that you, you're not using it properly? Because no, I, I, I think, I think it's about intention. It's, it's the same as people would talk about light when they were using flash, uh, you know, studio photographers, they would talk about intention. And like most people's intention with light for their landscapes is to have like a, a nice calming scene, warm light, you know, bit of contrast, that kind of stuff. And basically you just can't get that in the middle of the day. So it's not bad light. If, if you wanted to go out and shoot a picture that was representative of the middle of the, of the day, then, then the middle of the day is perfect. And there's nothing to say that that, like you go out and shoot like, I don't know, I, I think, um, we'll have a perspective on this because he, he goes and shoots peers and things like that. But like, I, I think that you would just, from a scenic point of view, maybe you would just look for something slightly different in the middle of the day. You would look for, you know, maybe floral foregrounds or, you know, kind of may, maybe you, you would try and kind of contrast a, a blue sky against a, a kind of, a, you know, a different colour from, from flowers or, you know, it's, sort of, it's kind of things like that. So go on, Will. Is there, an, is there such a thing as bad light? Apart from in cricket, um, I'll tell you what. When I, we, we had a couple of days in Newcastle, and I tell you, the light there was awful. It was just <laughs> pancake flat grey, and uh, that was very disappointing because you wanted some shots of the, of the Tyne Bridge and the Sage, and the Angel of the North, of course. And the, you know, the Angel of the North certainly didn't see those those grey days, but we made the best of it, and um, we got some shots of the Sage, which of course everybody else shoots at the Tyne Bridge, with everybody else shoots. But you know, it, it was difficult. But we did get some good light too. I'm, I'm relating back to my holiday. And one thing I know, Dan, as we were talking, is that I, I had an old Fujifilm X, um, X-T1 kicking about a few years back, and I had that converted to uh, infrared. Mm. So in the summer, infrared's brilliant because it's um, I, I like black skies and the fluffy clouds and the, the light foliage. So that's one thing for listeners to consider. I know it's not cheap. It's about 
depending on the camera, about 300 pounds for a conversion. But if you've got an old camera, you're not using much, get it converted, that's and, rather fun. And the thing is, like Will says, that's, you know, it, he's right, it's a, it's a significant outlay for anyone, um, unless you're a Premier League footballer. Um, or Will Chung. Yeah, or Will Chung, <laughs> you know, how in, into photography and into photography Premier League footballers are. But like, actually, it's only the price of a lens, isn't it? Like, a, you know, it's yeah. a reasonably affordable lens to take a camera and turn it into like a different tool that lets you kind of go and do something and see the world in a different way. I think it's like, it's actually money well spent. Well, if you've um, got your, I mean, Kingsley's, you know, you've obviously shot landscapes and Kingsley's obviously shot landscapes, but if you had your, I know you've got plenty of half days by the sounds of it, but if you had a half a day or a day and you weren't going to go and shoot a landscape, what, what, what would you uh, go out and try and photograph? It, it probably would be bugs. I mean, I, I was going to suggest, you know, this time of year, and if you get the right conditions, do something different, like like star trails. If you find a you know a good location, which is not too heavily influenced by light pollution, which I appreciate is difficult. But we stayed in a place um, called Twice Brood, and uh, that area is, is quite dark in Northumberland. So I'm just I was just thinking, actually, if you had half a day spare, do something completely different. Mm -hmm. and go out in the middle of the night, assuming it's clear. And you get a good spot and just try something different. I, I, I'm not an astrophotographer, but you know, I did wander off to um, uh, Sycamore Gap at half past 12 at night. Um, I was a bit wary because you know, I, I don't know exactly where to go, but I did, you know, we did reconnoiter the, the path. So the first time I went to Sycamore Gap during the middle of the day, well, actually, during late on in the afternoon by then, we, I went the route which followed the Roman Wall, and it's really quite steep, steep mm. going up and down. I thought that's hard work. But there's also a lower winter path, which is a rolling path. Um, and I realised that's the way to go. So when I started walking over there at half past 12 on my own with a, with a head torch, it was quite steep. I thought, this is different. So two very sort of different views there. So Will, you're basically, with somebody who's got half a day, go and do something different. Go and try something that you've not tried before because, hey, you know, what's the, what's, what can you lose? Kingsley much more like go and do something that you enjoy so um i suppose that's that's two sides of the uh two sides of the same coin plenty of uh, plenty of option going out I, I quite fancy will's idea and going out and photographing something completely different actually so uh, I'd, I'd definitely be an advocate of that one so hopefully that's um given you a few ideas of, of things that you can go and photograph um if you get a little bit of time off over the uh, the next few weeks This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. Use their free online valuation tool to instantly find out exactly how much your gear is worth. Get super fast payments straight into your bank account, and if you change your mind at any point, up until you get paid, they'll ship it back for free. Time for us to move on and answer some uh, listener questions. And because this, uh, this episode is sponsored by the lovely people at MPB, this first question is to them. It comes from a chap called Mike Asquith, and he says... I've been using a third-party 24mm wide-angle lens on my Canon EOS 5D Mark III for a while now, but I'd like to buy a wide-angle zoom. I'm keen to go used to get more bang for my buck, but I wondered which zooms MPB would recommend, Canon or otherwise. So, without further ado, we will get Ian at MPB to answer this question for you, Mike. Um, yeah, fantastic question from Mike. Um, and yeah, um, I think we do have a couple of, uh, of selections for you. So I'm going to start with the most expensive one. Um, and I want to assume you want to stick with Canon. I'm also assuming that you have the, uh, the Canon branded 24 mil uh, prime uh, for your Mark III, for your 5D Mark III. So we're going to start off with uh, the most expensive suggestion, which is the Canon EF 16 to 35 F2.8 LIS 3. So starting with the three, um, kind of uh, suffix, uh, it does mean that the three means uh, it's the third iteration of this 16 to 35 um, kind of zoom, uh, which means uh, that obviously Canon have um, perfected the lens over the years, uh, arriving at this third version, which should arguably be the best one uh, in terms of pure optical performance. So things like sharps across the frame, that kind of thing. Um, this being a wide angle zoom means that, you know, the majority of people will use this for pro photography. Uh, so event work, for example, when they need, when they need a wide lens, um, or more commonly um, for landscape photography when they want a bit of flexibility. Um, it's, it's truly a fantastic lens. Um, 
whether you need the f2.8 aperture is questionable uh, depending on the kind of work that you do um, i would probably say um, uh, probably generalizing a bit but most landscape photographers uh, photographers probably won't use the f2.8 aperture um, just because of the, the way that um, they they usually need or usually want to have a scene rendered which is with sharpness um, so think of tripods think of f8 apertures and whatnot so um, however you know i don't want to assume that you don't want to to use the the fast aperture um, so um, that lens comes in at uh, 1459 pounds in excellent condition so it's by no means a cheap lens but again i, I do need to reiterate that it's a fantastic lens it's an l lens so you do have uh, a bit of weather sealing on there and you also have obviously kind of better construction overall both from the optics and the overall kind of handling of the lens will be will be very very well uh, built um, dipping down from that, and I would argue, I think it would probably be my my suggestion for you, is the Canon EF 16-35 f4 LIS USM. So this is simply the f4 version of the lens. So it kind of loses a stop in um, in 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 the aperture. But arguably, if you're using this for landscape photography, for example, you're probably going to be living um, in the f8 to kind of f16 kind of territory. So if you're not going to be using f2.8 that much, not only will you save weight, um, uh, but you also save a considerable amount of money um, in terms of the lens. The lens otherwise is, um, I, I dare to say, identical. I don't want to say identical, but it is very, very similar construction, if not identical construction. Um, the focal range is exactly the same. You also get image, uh, image stabilization. And you also obviously benefit from the L range, uh, L range construction. Um, so um, this lens would come in at six hundred and eighty nine pounds in excellent condition. Um, and like I said, all you're losing is that um, extra stop um, in performance. So those would be my 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 two picks. With my top pick being the f four version of the sixteen to thirty five. So there you go. Hopefully that uh, gives you a little bit of insight. So the next one. Now then, this has actually been sent to Will directly. Uh, but I think I've got a feeling that either of you two chaps will be able to answer this. It comes from a chap on called Keith who emailed this in and he said, I'm wondering if you could give me some advice. I have a Nikon D7100 and I'm moving to full frame. I have a choice of either the D850 or the Z7 Mark II. I like wildlife, landscape, sport. Any help would be thankful, he says. So Kingsley, let's start with you. I believe you own both these cameras. I used to. I had to get rid of the 850 to get the Z7 II. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that answers your question, Keith. <laughs> so can, give, a, give a breakdown on the two cameras. You know, so wildlife, landscape, and sport. If we, if we put wildlife and sport in the same category as being the same sort of requirements, requisites for those two things, I know that's very broad. Which, which of the two cameras... That he's that he's got on his list there, D850 or Z7 Mark II. Which one do you think he should plump for? I I think um, I think from the point of view. So like if if, if you were saying about the landscape stuff, I, I would say it was. I, I'd say that I'd say there's probably like a, a, a reasonable case for saying the the Z7 II. Not that there's anything wrong with the 850 for landscapes. It's just that maybe if you could say that with the EVF, you get a better idea of exposure. And you, you know, it's sort of easier to see things like um, when you put grad filters in through an EVF, they're easier to see. Basically, uh, that's why I've one of the weird things that I've discovered about it. Um, it or rather, they would also like if you use the depth of field um, button, depth of field preview button, you could you could do it as well. But because you get this kind of live view of what's happening, you don't have to sort of mess around with that kind of stuff. Oh, and also the, the Z72 is, is smaller and lighter. Mm. So in theory, you know, you can take a light bag going up a hill and, the, you know, those kind of things. And I wouldn't say that all the lenses are necessarily smaller and lighter, but the, the body kind of certainly is. Um, so beyond that, like the, the sport and the wildlife thing, I wouldn't say there was much to choose between them. Like I have read some stuff where people say that the, the AF system in the 850 is superior for tracking uh, animals and, you know, sportsmen or women sports people um around um my issue would be like and partly you'd you'd think like when i've sort of shot moving dogs with the z7 II and the d850 i think i've had 
similar hit rates really in terms of kind of getting stuff in focus okay. the, the issue you could then say is that you you have blackout on both cameras because the uh you know the mirror the mirror's flipping up on the 850 and blocking your view and the, so something similar is happening on the z72 what i would say well, you know except without the mirror um but what i'd say is i never noticed it as badly on the 850 like i never noticed mirror blackout on the 850 in the same way that i notice it on the z72 because mm -hmm. what you get on the mirrorless camera is you get like more of a juddering mm. It feels more unnatural or less natural. Um, and to be honest, I if I was him, I I might I might even I mean it sounds crazy because it's going to be an expensive camera, but I might even keep my powder dry for the Z9 because, like, if you want a a, a camera that's going to be good for it's going to have an amazing AF and thanks to the stack sensor, isn't going to have any blackout. Maybe hang on for that, you know, or or look at a rival, possibly, who has stack sensors. But they're all expensive. Like, well, there's no such thing as a cheap, a cheap camera with a stack sensor in it. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, that's what you need for um, Sports and Wildlife. I, right. I don't think well, well they, they, okay, so I'm going to come to Will, but just to clarify, Keith, <laughs> Kingsley has basically said, which of those two cameras should you buy? Neither. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I, I think... I, <laughs> I think you can get some great results with either camera. And I'm really enjoying using my Z72 for landscapes. And I've got some really good pictures of dogs running about like I always do with a with a Z7 anyway. So so which one would you choose? Come on. I I'd pick the Z7 because it's okay. I, I think I think you know DSLRs are kind of going the way of all flesh. And, uh, <laughs> so, you, you, so might, you might as well jump on now. Will? Um <sighs> Well, Keith, it's a very interesting question, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave out the landscape part because I think Kingsley's answered that uh, well, so no problem there. But he's actually, only saying that because he's in my house. That there is that. <laughs> and I, I hate the disagree. Stop interrupting it just because you've had a drink. And there are two dog, dogs outside the front door as well. And um, look, the thing is about the, the the crop sensor camera for wildlife and sport is Keith's got the benefit of a one point five times gaming focal length, and that's a very much a good thing when you're shooting objects are very, very far away, like, like wildlife. And can I just say, I have both cameras too. Actually, I've got the Z7, not the Z7 II. But I used them both side by side recently. I went to RSPB Statistician. And um, just because I, I haven't done it much of it, I thought I'd try some follow focus on seagulls darting around the sky. And I have to say, I thought both cameras were pretty darn average. You know, I mean, obviously you've got to factor in user error here. I was using a Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary lens. So it was, it was quite a long lens, it's quite heavy. I wasn't on a gimbal, I was hand holding. Um, and it's not the easiest lens in the world to, to hand hold, although it's not the biggest tele zoom around. Um, but I thought both of them were quite average for, for tracking wildlife. And, and that's slightly different from, from maybe what he wants to shoot. I don't know what wildlife he does want to shoot. But for flying birds, and to be fair, you know, I, I was shooting next to somebody with a Sony A7R4, I think. I was shooting somebody with a, a top-end Canon. Um, and the guy with a top-end Canon was having most success on what I saw on screen. But it, it's a challenging subject, wildlife, challenging subjects, wildlife and sport. So, you know, you're shooting with a very high megapixel camera, camera here, the 45 megapixel cameras. So if I were, well, first thing, if Keith was sitting here, I would go, well, do you really need 45 megapixels? You know, because you might not. So I'd buy a full frame and enjoy the landscape with it, get the great quality out of it. But for the other stuff, you may be better staying put. Stick with the D7100. Yeah, right. why not? And, unless you seriously need the high ISO performance or the, or the resolving power of the two other cameras. And, you know, like I said, I use both cameras for, for birds. I've actually used on my aforementioned holiday. I did some birds from, from cars with them. And at the you know, I use them side by side, they're both doing pretty well. I use the Sigma lens, which is not a Z band lens, but I use it on the FTZ adapter on the Z7. It was all right. I mean, it wasn't brilliant, but it was all right. And the beauty of the mirrorless camera is you got focus point coverage throughout the, the, the frame, which on the 850, you're limited within the center one third roughly. So if you were trying some more interesting crops, it was more difficult with the 850, but you know, you use back focus and, and you know, recomposing, do all that sort of thing. But it's um, the challenging subjects. And if Keith, 
I think once you make the most of them, I'll consider staying with an APS-C format camera for them, and unless you need the high megapixel count, and maybe invest in a, as Kingsley said, maybe go for the Z7 II for, for landscape. It's a good so two votes for the Z7 II, I think, Keith, is what we've got out of that. And, but, but actually hold on to your D7100 maybe for the, for the, uh, the wildlife and, and sports stuff. Well, hopefully that that gives you uh, that gives you an answer, or maybe confuses you even further. But let's hope we can uh, with this last question, um, which has been sent in uh, from Philip Kluwer, um, another Nikon themed one here, chaps. Um, he says, Philip says, I've only just got round to listening to episode twenty five, the new gear special, um, and was interested in the discussion about lens availability near the end of the podcast, Jap- chaps. I'm sure you remember that. I'm thinking of changing to the Nikon Z system. Uh, but do you think Sigma and Tamron will start to produce Z mount lenses at some point? Um, do they have to wait until Nikon gives them a license to do so? Now, before we started uh, recording, uh, and obviously because we've all had a drink and I've forgotten what we said we were going to talk about, we were discussing the fact that the, a couple of independent manufacturers had just launched um, some uh, lenses actually for the uh, Fujifilm X series and Sony uh, camera systems. But um, Will, what what do you think? Sigma, uh, should he move to Nikon Z and hope that Sigma and Tamron are going to start putting out some uh, Z mount lenses? Or what, what's your view on that? Well, Roger, I, I'd imagine, you know, in the boardrooms in Tokyo and, and uh, Korea and Seoul, it's a matter of numbers. And that's why we're seeing a lot of lenses coming out for Sony E-mount, because... You know, Sony is selling their large numbers of cameras. It's very, very simple. Mm-hmm. And brands like Sigma, for instance, haven't even gone to Canon yet. And Canon, of course, they've got a huge following, certainly in the SLR world, but they're, they're lagging behind in mirrorless. But they're, they're catching up. And, and Nikon are further down the list. So, I mean, Philip's concern with Nikon with independent lenses is, is a real one. I think they, they will come because it's a matter, of, like I said, a matter of numbers. But they will prioritize the numbers first, and the numbers are at the moment Sony E mount, Canon mirrorless, and Nikon. Probably even well, I mean, Nikon in the full frame world, I'd be low those two. And of course, if you act brought in other formats like Micro Four Thirds and, and APS, Nikon, I think, are even lower than, than the other brands. So it's, it's a concern, but hey, look, I've, I've got Nikon and I'm, I'm happy staying with them. I don't see that being an issue because I think. Um, they will carry on, and I think Nikon are making moves to get more market share. They've just launched um, a, a classic camera in a, in a new f- format, which is the, the ZFC, which looks like the Nikon FM2, but it's got digital innards. And the rumors are rife on the Z9, which sounds like it's going to be, you know, 45 megapixel, 30 frames per second, uh, pro grip. So, you know, I think Nikon will be still swinging in there. So I've got confidence in the brand. Like I said, whether Tamron, Sigma, and everybody else comes out with independent lenses, it's a numbers game. Simple as that. Kingsley, what do you think? I, I, well, I, I, I'd echo that insofar as, like, if, uh, going back to what you said about new, um, new lenses being launched kind of recently, there were two recent stories, one from Voigtlander and one from... Tamron, uh, both bringing out their first Fujifilm X mount lenses. And so like, if you look at those companies, it's taken those companies quite a long time to produce a lens for, you know, what's quite a well, you know, entrenched system. Mm. So like Will says, you know, it's basically just comes down to whether they think there's enough people out there with the cameras to do it. Um, I don't, I mean, the thing, there's, there's, there, there are third party manufacturers like Samyang, um, Laowa, I'm made, so saying that right, you know, and a few other kind of like, you know, what you might call more kind of <laughs> garden shed type manufacturing. <laughs> oh, like, uh, I, I won't name them, um, but you know, they produce interesting optics quite cheaply. Um, it, it kind of depends what you want. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, f- sort of reading into the question, I, I guess it's to do with um, lens choices and also affordability. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say, you know, in terms of the Z mount lenses that Nikon produces themselves, there's a reasonable range now. Like, we, and you think kind of, it's actually, it's only been like, what is it, two years, two and a half years? Is it longer than that? It's longer than that. It's probably longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's felt like a long time. But you know, there's a decent spread of stuff there. So I don't think there's any reason not to. I, like Will, I think other people will come on board 
Um, and there's there's kind of there's there's plenty to like about it as a system. I would say that having bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think Philip's question was coming from the fact that he's a he's currently a Pentax user, and I think he was worried that um, you know Pentax seems to have become not a particular popular lens mount for for anybody, and I think he was uh, he was alluding to the fact that, that Nikon might be going the same way. But certainly, based on the on the three members of this uh, podcast <laughs> trio, uh, you've got a two thirds majority, um, uh, Philip. So hopefully. Um, there, there, there will be some coming along in, in due course. Um, Philip, as with the other guys who got in touch with us, uh, did so using the email address of podcast at photographynews.co.uk. So, um, Will, I've realised that we've got all the way through this podcast so far and not even given you a chance to extol the benefits or the virtues of your next issue. So um, what have we got in issue, what is it, 91? We, we've got some interesting nature stuff. So that's one thing about it. So anybody interested in nature, keep an eye out for that. I have done the main test though. That's very interesting because I have had queries about this and I tested the new Sigma camera. This is the FPL. Now, the FPL is a, it's a 2000 pound, very small full frame camera. It's got a megapixel count of uh, 61. So, you know, you can guess where that sensor came from. Um, and it's, it proved a very interesting camera. And I really don't want to give it away. I want our listeners to go away and read the thing, and read the review when it comes out. Because um, it was interesting because not only has it got very high resolution, but it's also got this very small form factor. You know, it's the smallest full frame camera out there. And the FP, when it came out, was adopted by movie makers because that was a 24K, sorry, 24 megapixel 4K camera. This is a 61 megapixel camera. So they're aiming at, at still shooters. So for me, that's the highlight of that particular issue, strangely enough. And um, you know what? I'm quite excited by that camera. I don't want to give it away, like I said, but I'm, I'm quite excited by it, you know? Well, you're not going to give anything away, Will, because by because the medium of podcast is audio only, but maybe for the benefit of myself and Kingsley only, you could <laughs> either you could now give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Interesting. Well, Interesting. Style. That's <laughs> definitely worth a read, I would say. <laughs> so, so that issue comes out when, Will? Uh, it comes out the 17th of August. The 17th of August. Oh, we're looking forward to. Absolutely. Which is, uh, so it's find out whether Will's thumb was up or down or hovering in the middle on the 17th of August. <laughs> so we, we, before we wrap up, um, as we always end a podcast uh, it's time for a Will's word of wisdom, although that was rudely interrupted by Kingsley on the last one who did a Kingsley word of wisdom as well. So <laughs> I'll come to Kingsley for a word of wisdom as well <laughs> after the uh, the mainstay, which is Will's word of wisdom. So what have you got, Will? I think going to Kingsley first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put him on the spot. Yeah. Kingsley, don't drink I'm, alcohol I'm, while I'm, podcasting. I'm just, I'm just I'm just riffing off Will. I don't I don't have my I don't have personal thoughts. I don't kind of you know I don't really exist. I'm just like a figment of his imagination. <laughs> Well, well, Rog, um, I've got a very simple one, and it, it sounds a bit dull, but to me it's quite important because I mentioned I've been photographing bugs, and as you both know, maybe some listeners know, but Annie, my partner, is an expert insect photographer, and because I've been spending time with her, and the, we haven't had the best weather for landscapes, but the sun's been very high up, I've, been, I've been got my macro lens out and got a flash gun on the camera, and I've been shooting bugs myself. Now, I'm not going to talk about how to photograph bugs because I'm not an expert, but I'll tell you what. I am covered in insect bites. I am covered in bites. And today I was actually out in the field on my own today, uh, just killing time. And I'm wearing full length trousers I am now. And I was following, I was following a, a, a damselfly, really pretty damselfly. I think it's called a beautiful demoiselle. And I was following it and it's on the ground and I was concentrating on the subject so hard because if you take your eye off these things and for an instant, they're gone. And I knelt down straight into a bunch of nettles and I, I hopped around the insect obviously disappeared and it was so painful and you know what the things about it is that I've got in the car a pair of knee pads which I hadn't put on so if I, I was just going to say to people if they want to go tackle insects think about uh, protection it might be uh, bug cream up to, to avoid getting bites staying covered up and maybe having even wearing long sleeves despite the, the, the hot weather and long Trousers, despite the weather, and if you have got knee pads, I know they look a bit stupid, and indeed you get you get odd looks when you do wear them. But if you do bugs, because you're working at a ground level, um, consider taking them. So basically, Rog, my word of wisdom is basically personal protection when you photograph insects, and 
make sure you've got a load of anti-sand in the car as well. So if you do get bitten, at least you can cover yourself with cream. So I know it's a strange one, but I'll tell you what, I am in serious agony right now. The irony, the irony of this is that if I if I remember correctly, uh, knee pads have been have, have been mentioned at least once previously as a as a tip for. Uh, I've got shares in the company. Yeah, I I'm one. <laughs> promoting them. The knee pad is a is certainly a a, a, a required photo accessory uh, according to Mr. Chung. Uh, Kingsley, would you like to have a Kingsley's word of wisdom, or are you uh, are you are you staying mute this time round? Um, well, the one, th <laughs> the one thing that, uh, not after Stella, no, um, <laughs> one thing that uh, occurred to me when we were saying that is like, so I, I've been testing the Nikon's new macro lenses, the ZMC uh, lenses, and I've, I've, what I've been doing is trying to, I've discovered that what I like the look of in a, in a picture, I've been taking pictures of flowers and, and leaves and things, but what I like doing is not taking a picture of the leaf that's on the, on the flower that's closest to me. I like um, finding one that's in the middle of a bunch of stuff mm. and kind of shooting through everything. So you get this kind of like depth, this kind of blurred foreground and this depth and stuff. And that's also an easy way to get yourself stung or <laughs> thistled or anything else. But my advice to that would be, you know, get over it. <laughs> As always. I'm going. Okay. Marvellous. Well... <laughs> Well, on that note, I think we should end. Um, I think just, just one final call, as, as we did at the end of the last podcast, I think we're still searching for somebody who's got more than 10 tripods um, and as, uh, who, can, who can send us photographic evidence of, of owning more than 10 tripods. Kingsley is still uh, holding that particular crown. And we're also looking for somebody who has got their roof lined with gadget bags more so than, than Mr. Chung. So again, if you can send us some photographic evidence, please do so to podcast at photographynews.co.uk or on our social media channels. Go on, Kingsley. Maybe to encourage people, we should make a pack that will send a bag or a tripod. <laughs> well, one of your twos, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> we've, got we've got some filters we can give away, like, <laughs> like the whole, like the top of the roof is just covered in filters, like, <laughs> like solar panels across yeah. the top. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, look, um, that brings us to the end of this uh, latest episode of the Photography News podcast. We will be back uh, in a couple of weeks, so there won't be such a long layoff as last time. Um, all being well, so that just uh, leaves me to say thank you very much to. Um, editor of Photography News, Mr. Will Chung. Lovely to see you, Will. Yeah, pleasure as always, Watch. Take care. We'll see you again soon. Indeed. And also to Mr. Kingsley Singleton, contributing editor. Thanks, Kingsley. And thanks for, thanks for, uh, <laughs> for lending out your house for your, for your recording, the pair of you. It's no problem. I apologise again for the furniture. Perhaps I need more beeswax or whatever <laughs> yeah. you put on furniture to stop it creaking. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. We will speak to you again before too long. Cheers. This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. Enjoy contact-free doorstep pickups which are safe, convenient, fully insured and completely free of charge. Plus, with a quarter of a million customers and five stars on Trustpilot, you can trust them and sleep easy.